I know we have a number of uh, fairly recent uh, people, uh, people, departures from the Worldwide Church of God, who have decided to attend the feast with us this year, and I certainly want to welcome all of you. We're delighted to have you with us. I would like to suggest that all of you who are relatively new from the Worldwide Church of God may want to fasten your seatbelts right now. Because I have something to tell you. The Feast of Tabernacles does not picture the millennium. Year after year after year, I stood before congregations a lot bigger than this one. Uh, I can recall one, I think, that was around 12,000, and preached that it did. Because we had uh, all had our inspired margins in the Bible where we had gone through college and put all the notes in there about what this means and what that means. And, and because there was an official meaning for the holy days and all these holy day seasons, that when the time came, uh, for the, the holy days came around and we decided we had to come up and preach about the holy days, we drug out our inspired meanings and we preached the holy days. And we had them all neatly packaged and we'd put them in a box and put a ribbon around them and put the box on the shelf and we have settled that question. Now, you really ought to know better than that when you think about God and what we have learned about him, that, that the depths and the breadths of the things that he has for us are reach out far beyond our meager capacity to grasp them in a lifetime. And the awareness that God says that it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, and it's the honor of kings to search them out, should tell us that all that meets the eye, all that seems to meet the eye, is not necessarily what is really there when it comes to this. Now, I'll give you the Sabbath morning challenge. Some Sabbath morning when you get home, get yourself your Bible, a concordance, and a nice notepad, and a cup of coffee with a pot of coffee standing by. Go to your easy chair and work your way through all of the marginal notes and the marginal references in your Bible and the all that you can find in your concordance that running back and forth about tabernacles and booths and all this type of thing. And when you get through with that Bible study, you will almost certainly come to a different conclusion to that which we had come to and had believed and had taught for so many years. Now let me underline the problem for you. You'll just turn back to Leviticus 23, to the old original commandment to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Now, this is where they all are, all the holy days, including the Sabbath day, which is a, a festival. And they're all laid out for us here from the Passover in the spring all the way to the last great day in the autumn with significances given for them. And on this Feast of Tabernacles, it begins in verse 33. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. The first day will be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Now it goes on to explain about the seven days, the offerings to be done on the seven days, and on the eighth day was to be another holy convocation. Actually a, a separate festival because the Feast of Tabernacles is only seven days. And yet then there is the eighth day tacked on the end of it, which is also a Sabbath of rest and also a holy convocation. And so we work our way through these things and preach them. But now notice in verse 39. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take to you the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of the thick trees, willows of the brook, and you are to rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Take tree limbs and rejoice? Uh, what do you do to rejoice with tree limbs? Boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees. Seems a little strange, doesn't it? Wave them, put them on the ground and walk on them. Uh, well, there's a little hint. You shall keep it a feast of the Lord your God seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in huts, booths, tabernacles, temporary dwellings, for seven days, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, tents, huts. Now, what they're talking about when they talk about the boughs of goodly trees, it's not at all unlike what we used to do in the South. Every year, whenever the harvests were generally in, the revival time came around, and the preachers, sometimes the traveling circuit preachers, would come around. And what was commonly done was they would go out and find themselves a field or a spot, and they would take branches of trees, and they'd put poles at the four corners, and they'd put poles across the top, 
And then they would bring in the branches of trees and create what is called, they called a brush arbor. What the Bible would have called a, a hut, a tabernacle, a, you know, a booth, as it were. So we built a brush arbor, and in that brush arbor, everybody gathered together, and the preacher preached, and the people prayed, and, and I remember going to one of those where all the people would kneel by their little benches or chairs around the place and all pray out loud at the same time. You know, it was fervent because, you know, to get your prayer heard above everybody else, you had to speak up. As a boy, it was a very strange thing to me. I, when I was in town, I went to the Baptist church, which was one way, and when I was in the country with Grandma and Grandpa, I went to the brush arbor, and it was something else. It was something else indeed. So that's what it's talking about, but it's not sort of a collective meeting brush arbor. It was the, the, uh, the person had their own little dwelling. Now, in Mount Sinai, uh, the brush arbor would make a lot of sense because you need shelter from the sun and from the heat. And the brush or the tree limbs, or if there were, if you were able to find out in the Sinai anything like this, uh, it would give you shade. In a rainy area where the rain's coming down, they're not going to help you at all. In fact, in Arkansas, there were times the brush arbor was not at all what was called for. But nevertheless, that's what they did because they had read about this in the Bible, and that's what they were going to do. Now, it goes on to say you do this, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, there are two troubling questions in this passage. I don't know if you tumble to both of them, but there are two very important ones. The first one is this statement. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Now, then if you're not an Israelite, weren't born an Israelite, you don't have to do that. And this would tend to lend credence to what a lot of people have believed all along, that these are Jewish holidays, that they're strictly for the old Israelites. They don't have anything to do with Christians or people of other nations, other times, other circumstances. And then it is even confirmed because it, the reason that is given for it is that, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So the first question, what about this all that are Israelites born? And the second one is that the typology is all wrong. Now let me explain to you what I mean. I, my very earliest recollections of religion of any kind were not from church. My very earliest recollections of religion were from music. My father, when I was just a very small boy, sang bass in a gospel quartet back in the hills of Arkansas and in the hills of eastern Oklahoma. He was uh, the bass of the Stamps, uh, Arkansas Stamps Quartet, which was based in Salem Springs, Arkansas. They had a daily radio program. It was live. Didn't have any tape back in those days. And they would sing their, their, their daily broadcast, and on the weekends they would take off for the different little towns in Oklahoma and Arkansas, and they would hold concerts. And these are pre-television days and pre-radio for a lot of people who didn't have them. And whenever an event like that came, about everybody turned out. And I can remember going to schoolhouses and what have you over those places and, 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 and sitting there and listening to it. And, and it was a show. The whole thing was a marvelous show. But also in, this, in, in, in the context of it, there was a great deal of, of, of very heartfelt sentiment expressed in the course of the songs that were sung there. Now, I began to learn from the very earliest years of my life. I didn't put it all together to begin with, but I began to learn the basics of the plan of salvation at the feet of a gospel quartet. Because there were, for example, take the old theme of the Jordan River, which is a recurring theme. It comes up again and again and again and again in gospel songs. Well, the theme arises out of a fairly simple reading, straightforward reading of the Bible, and putting together from both Old and New Testament the ideas that are expressed there. The Jordan River in hymnology and, of course, in the old gospel songs was symbolic of death and resurrection, of passing from this life into the next. On this side of the Jordan, we are in the wilderness. We are wandering. We are away from home, and we're seeking home. We are bound for the promised land. The old song, you know, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand, which is in our book and cast a wistful eye at Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. And then we go on to sing, I am bound for the promised land, I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. What a great old song. But it was talking about is, Jordan means we're leaving this life. 
that we're going on to something better. A lot of those people assumed it was heaven. They, they were not theologically sophisticated people. They were people who simply read the Bible and found hope there. They found a hope that, that was able to touch their lives in ways that some high-flown theology might not ever manage to do. There's a lot in common, actually, in the old gospel music that I used to hear as a boy back in the hills of Arkansas and Oklahoma. There's a lot in common with that and the Negro spiritual. The, the blacks in this country in the earliest years, you know, having been in slavery themselves or still being in slavery, I think, when many of these old spirituals were written, identified so strongly with the Israelites of old because, you know, you go and read the Bible, where is someone with whom you can identify if you're a slave? It's those Israelites. And so all these these old songs that say, go down, Moses, go down and tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. And all the way from letting his people go to coming out of Egypt and going through the Red Sea and going on through the wilderness and crossing that Jordan into the Promised Land are found in, in, in black spirituals. They are found in, in, in the old type of, of, of gospel song with which I grew up in those years gone by. Now let me just explain to you, this, is, and this, this little concept that I'm going to talk about here is known from the simplest to the most complex of religious people in this world. It's known, it's believed by people of the Assembly of God, by Baptists, by Methodists, Presbyterians, High Church, Anglicans, and Catholics. Know from one end to the other the symbolism that I'm going to lay out for you right here and now. Egypt is a model or a type, a symbol of sin. The dominating, captivating force of sin. We are sold into sin. We are sold into slavery. And we serve out our lives in a hard bondage of slavery. And then along comes God. And by the death of the firstborn, we're delivered from the shackles of slaves. And we're set free. And out we go. And we keep the Passover. And the days of unleavened bread, which all are connected with the deliverance from sin, the deliverance from Egypt. We're free. We're free at last. And it finds expression so many ways in the Bible. And then we make our way out through the wilderness and finally come trapped against the Red Sea. And the Egyptians are behind and the sea is in front. And Moses with stretched out arms and prays and God puts back the water like a wall on both sides. And we are baptized in the waters of the Red Sea as we go dry shod across the bottom. So that the deliverance from sin, the miraculous deliverance from sin, the miracle of baptism is then pictured in all of this as Israel was baptized in the Red Sea and came out on the other side. Then follow the years of the wilderness wandering where God taught them and gave them his law and helped them to understand the difference between right and wrong. At the end of the period of time of wilderness wandering, which was 40 years longer than it should have been, they come to Jordan's stormy banks and the waters are high and it's a time of year when the floods are going on and there's no way to get across that Jordan River. But the priests take the ark and they start walking out into the water and the water stops. And they go dry shod again across the bottom of the Jordan River, putting up a, a pile of stones in the middle just to say, we've been here, this is where we crossed. And the symbolism of passing from the wilderness into the promised land. And the promised land finds expression in so many ways in songs and gospel songs and hymns as of going home, finally arriving, the kingdom of God, heaven in the eyes of many people because they, these people, as I said, are not you know, theologically sophisticated. But they know a few things. They know that God exists. They know about sin. They understand slavery. They understand the importance of freedom. They knew was, know, know what it means to go through this miserable, rotten life we've got here with no hope and to finally come up against something somewhere that gives some hope. Many of them are moved to write songs that will move you to tears. Even though they may not understand some of the theological niceties of many of the things that, that, that we might have to say. The promised land, then, is the kingdom. Now, the old formula, tabernacles, dwelling in booths, if you go back to Leviticus 23 and it says why you dwell in booths, it doesn't fit the pattern, does it? Because I made you to dwell in booths all the years that I brought you out of the land of Egypt before you entered the promised land, before you crossed Jordan, that, in fact, for Israel of old, that period of time of dwelling in booths was a reminder that they are strangers and pilgrims and they're not home and that they're bound for a city, that they're headed for the kingdom of God, that, that there's something out there ahead. It's a time of, of looking to a promise and it pictures a time of wandering in the wilderness a whole lot like you and I do now. 
Now, consider the other question I raised. Why did it say that all who are Israelite born shall dwell in booths, that, that they may remember that I made them to dwell in booths when I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt? Now, something crystallized for me on this in the last year. So I, while I have talked about this to some of you, some, some of the, the uh, CGI old heads, some of what I'm saying will be familiar to them. But there's something that crystallized for me in the course of the last year because of a, a debate I was having with some people on the Internet who were of the New Covenant, New Understanding, Worldwide Church of God uh, bent. One of the fellows on there was waxing eloquent about a problem that he saw for the way he thought, he thought they basically had us in the, in, in the corner on this one, that the Sabbath commandment was given to Israel with two totally different meanings that were given to them in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. Now, you're familiar with this, aren't you, that you've got the Ten Commandments given in Exodus 20, and then you have another statement of the, 20, of the, of the Ten Commandments given in Deuteronomy 5. And there are some differences. There is a singular difference between the two of them relative to the Sabbath day. And something began to dawn on me as a result of this debate, which I don't know if I had really quite focused on in that way before. Now, if you want to turn back with me to Exodus 20, I'll show you what I'm talking about. In Exodus 20, the, t the, the commandment in question begins in verse 8. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now there's a curious little play on words here that is lost in most translations. It starts off saying the same thing, in a sense. It says, remember the Sabbath day to hallow it because God set it apart and hallowed it. The word hallow, or to make holy, or to keep holy, just simply means set it apart. It starts off by saying, remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. What do you mean set it apart? Well, there are seven days a week, aren't there? Yeah. Well, you set this one day apart from all the rest. That's easy to understand. Okay, there's the commandment. Remember it and set it apart. How do you do that? You do it, it tells you right here. You do it by not doing any work. You work on the other six days. This day you don't. Not only do you not work, but your son, your daughter, your cow, your ox, your ass, your animals. I doesn't mention dogs because your dog is going to watch your house no matter whether it's a Sabbath or not. Uh, they do their job uh, seven days a week. Okay, there it all is, isn't it? But there's one more thing. Here's what you are to do. Here's how you are to do it. Then there is the set next part, why. You do it, you set it apart, because God set it apart. When did God set it apart? Well, let's see what it says. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day, Sabbath day and set it apart. I would conclude from that that he set it apart at creation. Now, then Jesus comes along and says, the Sabbath was made for man, and man was not made for the Sabbath. And so I would conclude the Sabbath was made for man. That's safe enough. When was man made? Just a day before the Sabbath was made, right? So the Sabbath was made for man when man was made. God made man, put him in there, and the first thing he said, let's take the day off. Which I thought was nice of him, you know, as you... You get a good rest to start with. All right. So far, so good. The Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made when man was made. We set it apart by not working because God set it apart by not working. Easy, isn't it? All right. Now let's turn back to Deuteronomy 5 and see if we can understand where the problem came in. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 12 words are just a little different, but the theme is the same. Keep the Sabbath day to set it apart. As the Lord your God has commanded you, six days shall you labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your ox, your ass, nor any of your cattle, 
nor any stranger that is within your gates, so that your manservant and your maidservant may rest just like you rest. It's not good enough for you to take the time off. You've got to give those people over whom you have control the time off as well, including your animals. You don't work your ox on that day. Then it says this. There is a why at this point that is different from the why we saw before. And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there through a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, why should this be a problem to anybody? It seems to me to be as simple as A, B, C. God created the Sabbath at creation when he created man. The Sabbath was made for man. And so in the process of explaining the Sabbath for man, we get Exodus 20. But when we come along to Israel, who is brought out of Israel, I mean brought out of Egypt and out of sin, who is brought to Mount Sinai and into whom God enters a covenant, we learn that there is an old covenant significance attached to something much older than the old covenant. That old covenant significance was for Israel was to say this, you of all people, you who have been a slave, you who were made to labor seven days a week, 12 hours a day, from dawn till dark, from when you could see to when you couldn't see. You of all people must keep the Sabbath day, and you of all people must not require others to work for you because you were slaves. And to argue that because that covenant got laid aside, that the Sabbath got laid aside with it, is foolishness of the worst sort. For the Sabbath has two meanings. It has one for all mankind. And then it had something special over and above that for Old Covenant Israel. It's not that hard when you get right down to it. Now, back to the question that I had asked before. What about this Feast of Tabernacles thing? And what about this thing about all who were Israelites born? Well, take your Bible in your hand and turn back to Zechariah, right close to the end of the Old Testament. And I'll show you where the difference comes in. It's really rather astonishing to read this in the light of what so many people seem to believe about the Holy Days, the festivals, about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and all the things you think they think they know about God. Zechariah 14 is an end-time prophecy. It's easy to get it right from verse 1. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. The day of the Lord is that end-time day of the Lord at the time of Christ's return, the day of God's wrath. Your spoil shall be divided in the midst of you. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city shall go into captivity. The rest of the people shall not be cut off. There is an end-time captivity of the city of Jerusalem foretold here. It's shocking to consider. But he goes on to develop what is going to take place. But he says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the old days of battle. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there will be a very great valley, and half the valley will move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Man, there's a spiritual for you. You know, he'll stand on the Mount of Olives, and the mountain shall cleave in two. Those, that's gospel stuff. Move that mountain north and move that mountain south. And there's going to be a river that flows out of that mountain that will heal the Dead Sea. Man, that's great stuff. You will flee to the valley of the mountains. And then he says in verse 8, It shall be in that day that, li in that, day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half toward the former sea, half toward the hinder sea, in summer and winter it shall be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. Hallelujah is the only word that comes to mind about that. And the land will be turned like a plain from Geba to Rimmon south of Jerusalem. It will be lifted up, inhabited in all these places. Men shall dwell in it. Verse 11. There shall be no more utter destruction. Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Now, anybody here have any question about where we are in this prophecy? We're looking at the return of Christ, the establishment of the kingdom of God the putting down of all opposition to God's government, a new world, a new government, a new regime altogether. And it says, and this shall be the plague, for with God shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. And it gets kind of nasty. Here's where they got the idea for the, uh, 
the special effects in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you want to know where it came from. Then read in verse 15. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations, nations, Gentiles is what it's talking about here, that came up against Jerusalem, all the people gathered around in the battle of the great day of God Almighty, Armageddon is what we're talking about, all those nations, it says, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, that is to do obeisance to the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. What? What happened to everybody who was Israelite born? Well, we've gotten way beyond that real sudden-like, haven't we? He then says, It shall be that whichever one of them will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, upon them there shall be no rain. Now I ask you this. Are we talking voluntary here? Or are we talking about a feast that you can keep or not keep depending upon how you feel this year? Doesn't sound to me like it. You don't go, no rain. There are sanctions against those who don't do this. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Ha! Huh. The Egyptians, they don't normally get rain. They depend on the rising of the Nile. So they don't come. And God says, all right, the plague is going to be what's going to come upon you. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now let me see if I've got this right. The Egyptians are going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and dwell in booths so that they can remember that the Lord made them to dwell in booths when they came out of the land of Egypt. No, that doesn't work, does it? And the Canadians or the, uh, uh, the Africans or the, the people from Asia, because these are a part of all the nations, and they're all going to come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and it has absolutely nothing to do with Israel's exodus from Egypt. And they still keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, I conclude from this, see if you're with me on this, that there is one meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles for the world, and there is another, much narrower and more specific, meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles <coughs> for Old Covenant Israel. One that was above and beyond what anybody else might have, might have had, believed, faced, or needed to deal with. So I think that, uh, you know, that type of thing can be fairly well understood. Now, what is also interesting about this is the whole world keeps this feast during the millennium. And if the Feast of Tabernacles pictured the millennium, uh, I can hear a lot of people saying, well, it's been fulfilled now. There's no need to keep the feast now. On the other hand, what if it hasn't been? What might it mean and where might it go? If there is a broader meaning for the Feast of Tabernacles, what might that meaning be? And what is also just as interesting to me, how old might it be? Now, if you do what I suggested, and you follow the, the Sabbath morning cup of coffee Bible and concordance challenge, and work your way through this, you'll find very, very easily and very quickly the idea of tabernacle is a temporary dwelling. It's a tent. It's a place you go and live for a little while. Then you'll run into all sorts of, especially New Testament references, where it talks about the body old body as being a tabernacle. It's just an old tent, and we've got it on for a little while, and we're going to put it off. And it gets old, it wears out, it breaks tent poles, you know, you get mice eat holes in it. It's just something old, and it gets older year by year, and it wears out. That's what the body is. And they'll talk about the body as a tabernacle, and how we're only in it for a time, and how the time is going to come when we're going to put it off. And we're going to put off this mortal, and we're going to put on immortality. Remember all that language? I won't take you to all those scriptures and run them through you. Through at this time, you know them anyway and can find them for yourself with no difficulty with your own concordance. The idea behind the Feast of Tabernacles is the transitory, temporary nature of man, and it is far older than Moses, much older than Moses. In this chapter, we find a man called Abraham, whom I spoke of somewhat yesterday. Verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place that he should afterward receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of, uh, in, sorry, in, in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him, 
of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and whose maker is God. Now the thing that hit me about that, as I read it, is this. Here is a man who was a city dweller and lived in a city to start with. He was at home. And God said, I want you to get up and I want you to go out of here and to go to a land that I'm going to show you that I am going to give you. You're going to possess everything from here to there. It's going to belong to you. And so he got up and he went to that land. And what this passage tells us is that he lived his entire life in the land of promise as a stranger. Doesn't that seem odd to you? Because, I mean, I left my home. I've traveled far. I have come here. This is mine. Why can't I put down roots here? Why can't I build a house? Why can't I be at home? Why can't I begin to govern this land? Why can't I tell these people to leave? This belongs to me. Why is it that every time my cattle have begun to graze out this area, I have to get my servants together. I have to pull up all the tent stakes. We have to roll up all the tents and load them up on the animals. And we have to move over this ridge and into the next valley. And up over that ridge and into that valley. And we have to find a new well of water. We have to dig a new well of water. And here we are in a new place, a new time. We roll out the tents. We pound in the tent pegs. We put the ridge poles up. And we're home again for a while. This man lived his entire life like that and never received the promise. You know what else? Isaac lived his entire life the same way and never received the promise. You know what else? Jacob lived his life the same way and never received the promise. And we pass on down to this, uh, this, this th verse 13. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them a long way off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Well, here you are. Do you realize that you're actually making a confession by being here? The confession is that you are a stranger, you're a pilgrim, you're not at home, and you're saying before God and man, I don't belong here, I'm looking for something else, there is more to life than this, and I'm going to sojourn in the land of promise as a stranger. It is a confession of faith, the Feast of Tabernacles is. I suppose that may be one reason why the Worldwide Church of God has decided to call it a Feast of Faith. But it's hardly a necessary transition to make. When God, of course, gave us the Feast of Tabernacles, which I thought was really, really pretty nice itself. You know, for Abraham, being temporary was a way of life. Every problem he had, and every problem you have, is temporary. Because all this stuff's going to pass. That means, if you think about it, if every problem you have is temporary, that means that every solution you find to your problems is also temporary. And so that when you solve a problem, you have not solved it. You've merely transitioned from this problem to the next problem. And you will go on and on through problems that pass and solutions that pass until finally you pass and you are no longer here either. Abraham looked for a city with foundations. Now, you know, the only place in the Bible that I really find anything like that is in Revelation. And one wonders... A, how the writer of Hebrews knew that, and B, how Abraham knew it. For there is nothing about this city with foundations until you get to Revelation 21, where you have a city with 12 foundations, and on those 12 foundations, the names of the 12 apostles and the garnishment of all kinds of precious stones on those foundations of that city. Now, if you'll take a look at this in chapter 21, there are a couple of very important things to notice. John, by the way, was not in the future. He was in vision and was seeing the future. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, he said, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now something occurred to me as I was reading it. If I walk out under the night sky and there's a new heaven up there, uh, what does that mean? 
Does that mean if I look to get my little compass out and look around to find north, that it's not Polaris that is there, that there's some other constellation sitting there that I have never seen before in my life. It's a pattern of stars. I don't know what it is. I don't know what they are. And I look over this way, and here is a Milky Way, but it, it's different. It's much stronger than the one I, I'm used to. And I look around for the Pleiades, and it is not there. And I look around for uh, Ursa Major, it is not there. For Ursa Minor, it is not there. I look for the Serpent, it is not there. I look for all the familiar things in my sky, and they are not there. Of course, you understand, don't you, that uh, you don't have to move very far from where we are in the universe till everything looks different. That in fact, if we were still here, I think another 10,000 years from now, you would be under a new heaven then. It would not be the one that you see now. Everything will have moved in that period of time. I may have, may take a little longer than 10. I forget the, some of the things that I have read on that. So, in one sense of the word, if there's a new heaven and a new earth, you could be on a different planet in a different place, and that's what you've got. A new planet. And naturally, the skies over you are all different, for you're in some place totally different from where we are right now. I don't, is that what this means? I have no idea. I just thought of it. And I said, I, saw, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, there's something troubling about that, that verse. Do you catch it? Because normally what we think of when we tabernacle through this life, and Abraham said he looked for a city that had foundations, and I've preached this myself in many ways in the past, that we're not home now, we're going to be going home. And when you get to the new heavens and the new earth, one would think you had gone home, and that we're all ready to settle down and live with God forever, right? Then why is God still in a tabernacle? Why is he still in a tabernacle? It suggests to me that all the way to the new heavens and the new earth and the heavenly city coming down like a bride adorned for her husband, 1,500 miles on a side and 1,500 miles straight up. And we're still not home. We have not got there. We, we have not, not been able to arrive at this place. Oh, it is so encouraging, you know, when you come to something where it says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. No more sorrow, no crying, nor any pain, for all the former things are passed away. And that's true for those who get to enter that city. And he, said, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for the words are true and faithful. It's, it's mind-boggling to consider what all this means. But the tabernacle of God is with men, and God apparently is still not home. You know, there was a time, somewhere back in time and space, if you'll bear with me for a moment, that God stepped up to a blackboard and decided he would outline his plan. And went write it all up here. And if he did things like, I would just get out, you know, blackboard or whatever, you take your pick, it's spiritual we're talking about. I'm, I'm in vision right now. And if you do things like people do them, you write, to, to outline a plan, at the very top of the board, you write what it is we're trying to do. You write the goal, the objective. What would you give to know what God wrote on top of that board? What is the goal? What is the objective? What do you think that might be? You know, Paul said that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are understood being seen by the things that are made. And you know, one thing is clear to me, that whatever God wrote on the top of that board, it was not limited to putting a small planet around a third-rate sun two-thirds of the way out on the wing of an ordinary galaxy somewhere, and then peopling it with grub worms, Watching all these grub worms struggle and struggle throughout 6,000 years and then sending half of those grub worms to hell. I, I just don't think that's what it was all about. When you consider, if you will just for a moment, the size and the scope of what he has done, just consider the size and the scope of what he has done. 
There was a time, they tell us, that scientists agree with the Bible in this regard now. If you go back far enough in time, there was a time when there was nothing. That our universe began, according to Stephen Hawking, with a, as a singularity, which was one, everything that there was in the universe was in one place. One tiny point called a singularity, and out of that comes the Big Bang and the explosion of the universe, which has been going on for billions of years, with all the matter in the universe being scattered as though it were from a gigantic explosion out into the far reaches of the universe. Now, anybody here have a car that you have over 186,000 miles on? Have you ever put more than more miles than that? Some of you have. It took you a few years to do it, didn't it? 186,000 miles is how far light travels in one second. One second. And they tell us that the nearest star, we go out at night and wander around and look up and see there's one there and there's one. The nearest one to us, the light that falls on the retina of your eye, took four years traveling at the speed of light to get there at 186,000 miles per second. It, I, I don't even know what that means, do you? I can't even deal with that. And when you look at the Milky Way at night and you realize it, this is a galaxy, and our planet sits around a star which rotates around the center of this galaxy, and they say it's about two-thirds out on, uh, from, from this big circular galaxy, this disk that is here. And you realize that this galaxy in which we find ourselves is composed of billions, not, not millions, but billions with a B of stars. It staggers the mind. But then to realize that as you look out here at night, and many of the, of the objects that you see in the heavens that you would call stars are not stars, they're galaxies. Now, this just blew my mind when I thought about this and tried to grapple with it. They, and one of the things I read suggested that from one edge of our galaxy to the other edge of our galaxy, the distance, because in these things you don't measure distance in miles, you measure them in the terms of the years that it takes light to travel from one place to the other. Are you with me? Light years. They say, say that the, 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 the diameter of our galaxy is 100 million light years, that the light passing from one side of the galaxy to the other side of the galaxy takes 100 million years to get from here to there. Now, so far so good? You go out there tonight and take a look off out this way somewhere, find yourself a fairly bright object in the heaven, and the odds are that that bright object is not a star, it's a galaxy. And in that galaxy there are billions of stars. And the thing is probably going to be about a hundred million light years across, and all you see is a point of light. Then turn around and look this way, and you'll find another bright object in the sky up there, and understand that the odds are that that's also another galaxy that's a hundred million light years across, composed of billions of stars. Then consider the, dis the distance between that one and this one in terms of light years if this little point of light is 100 million light years across, how far is it from there to there? Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm trying to help you understand the size of this thing is enormous. It's mind-boggling, and in fact, they tell us that we're not dealing with 100 million light years. That to the edge of the universe, from where I stand, at the edge of the universe, is something they say like 15 billion light years away. And then they put the age of the universe at 15 billion light years, and I'm supposed to understand this. Because I turn around and look this way, and it's 15 billion miles, or sorry, light years, to the nearest thing that way, and it's 15 billion miles light years to the one that way. Doesn't that add up to 30? Shouldn't it take light 30 billion years to go from that one to that one? I'm sure it doesn't go from that one to that one, but if it were to, and I, and I ask myself, how big is this thing? And in a way it becomes utterly irrelevant because I can't grapple with it. I can't get hold of it or somehow deal with it. But you know what is really staggering? Most, by far and away most, of the universe is out of sight. You can't see it. In fact, the Hubble telescope can't see it all, much less you. You go out there tonight, and what you will see is a very tiny fraction of the universe. So, I would conclude from that that the universe is not out there for us to look at. Is that logical? Since most of it's out of sight anyway, 
It wasn't put up there just to decorate the night sky. And that's awesome to consider, but it has to be considered. Whatever God is doing, whatever it is he wrote at the top of the blackboard, when he started all this stuff out, A, it is not small. It is no minor thing. It is no little thing. And I will tell you something else. Our little 6,000 years of history is not what he wrote at the top of that blackboard. We are somewhere down the scale of all the things that he was planning to do and of all the things that he did do. But we are not that thing that he wrote at the top. It is just too much bigger than that. Now, how about this Feast of Tabernacles thing then? That we come here and we observe it and we make a confession. It does seem, the Feast of Tabernacles does seem to be about our little 7,000 year history of things. Notice I said seven. I think the Feast of Tabernacles includes the millennium. That in fact, it may well even turn out to be that the millennium is the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, if you want to look at it typologically, but I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not saying that that is the case. I'm just reaching out now to the things that God has put out there. For it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search it out. Maybe then the millennium could be the seventh day of the feast because big as it seems to us, and the millennium does seem like a great thing to us, and we look forward to it as we should. We sing about it. We pray for it. We long to cross the Jordan into the promised land. It's a great and wonderful thing, and it's important to us. As big as it is to us, the millennium really doesn't amount to much on the scale of 15 billion years, does it? A thousand years is as a day in his sight. It's like a, a lifetime, folks. It's like a watch in the night. It's, not, it's like grass that grows up and the heat gets on it and it's blown away. That everything that we think and the biggest things that we can deal with and have in our lives and all the important things that we have are nothing. They're just nothing. You pick a dandelion in the field and you blow it and all the little things go floating off and we, I'm sorry, are less than that on the scale of a universe of 15 billion light years or 30 from one side of it to the other. God has given us this Feast of Tabernacles, this little exercise, to make a confession that we are strangers and that we are pilgrims and that we seek a city with foundations whose builder and whose maker is God. I spent a Sunday with my sister recently and we went over some, my mother had died last year and we we were going over some old pictures that she had put together, and, and her son-in-law had put together for me and had re, remastered, as it were, a tape of some old things they had found of, of, of a gospel quartet that was nearly contemporary with my father's. Uh, I have no re tape recording of my father's voice. I'm, I wish I did. But it was the st old Statesman Quartet, and they had done an album in which they had done many of the old stamp songs, the same songs that my father and, and his quartet had done over the years that, that I had listened to them. And I was listening to this, to this tape while Allie was off in the, uh, getting some fried chicken for the uh, festival in Houston a few weeks ago. And as I listened to it, I heard a song that I had not heard, I think, anywhere except in the shower as I sang it myself since I heard my father's quartet sing it, Lo, those, what shall I say now, 50-odd years ago when I was just a little boy. And it broke me up. I wept openly. I had tears running down my face as I read it, as I, as I heard it, because it, 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 it said so much to me about so many things. And the realization of the things that are important as opposed to the things that are not. And it actually speaks in a lot of ways to the hope that we bring with us to the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles pictures our lives as we live them now. It's a confession of our temporary nature, that it is. But it helps us to look forward to something far greater than even the millennium, which is another time of struggle and human struggle and of growth and of overcoming. The song is, is, is an old gospel song. I think it was written by Albert E. Brumley. I'll try to read it to you. I hope I can even get through it because it was so, so, so moving to me when I heard it. I will meet you in the morning by the bright riverside when the last winds of sorrow have blown, when we will all be together and be happy for I, while the years and the ages shall roll. I'll meet you in the morning 
with a how do you do. And we'll sit down by the river and with rapture, old acquaintance renew. You'll know me in the morning by the smile that I wear when I meet you in the morning in the city that is built foursquare.